everyone. My name is Ed Flynn, and I'm the City Council President. Viewers can watch the Council meeting live on YouTube by visiting boston.gov slash city council dash TV. I would like to ask my colleagues and those in attendance to please silence their phones and electronic devices at this time. Thank you. I'd also ask, to, uh, I'd also ask um, that we all be respectful and do not disrupt the meeting uh, while you are here. If you are disruptive, unfortunately, you will be asked to leave. If you fail to comply, you will be escorted out. Please also note that according to city council rules, there are no signs allowed in the chamber. Mr. Kirk, will you please call the roll to ascertain the presence of a quorum? Braden. Councillor Edwards. Sorry. No more. Councillor Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Councillor Clarity. Yeah. Councillor Flynn. Here. Yeah. Councillor Lara. Councillor Louis Jen. Here. Councillor Mejia. Here. Councillor Murphy. Here. And Councillor Worrell. Present. We have a quorum. Thank, thank you, Mr. Clark. Um, Mr. Clark, will you please add um, Councilor Lara. Yes. This week's clergy is Father Father Orestes Drosos from, from Saint Nectarios, Greek Orthodox Church. He was invited by Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, would you like to come up to the podium and introduce Father, please? morning, or afternoon, rather. Uh, Father Odysseus Drosos was born and raised in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. He attended the Annunciation of the Virgin Mary Church, serving in the altar and involved in the youth ministry programs. He earned a Bachelor of Liberal Arts degree in pre-theology from Hellenic College in Brooklyn, Brookline, Mass. in 1990, and he earned a Master of Divinity from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Brookline, Mass. in 1993. Father Odysseus served as the pastoral assistant at St. Nicholas Greek Orthodox Church in Oakland, Illinois. Well in the Chicago area, he met his wife, Maria Calvias, and they were married on February 5th, 1995 at Holy Apostles Greek Orthodox Church in Westchester, Illinois. He was ordained to the deaconate on July 17th, 1995 at the Annunciation Church in Montreal, Quebec in Canada, and ordained to the priesthood on July 18th, 1995 at St. Pentelimon Greek Orthodox Church in Markham, Ontario, Canada, where he served as a parish priest until August 31st, 2019. Uh, he has also served as the Director of Social Services and one of the founding directors of the Summer Camp uh, Metaphor Metamorphosis, which is a youth camp. He has also served as a professor and instructor of Byzantine music in both the Patriarchal Toronto Orthodox Theological Academy and the Byzantine School of Music, as well as the chaplain in the Metamorphosis Greek Orthodox Day School in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Father Odysseus then served at St. George Greek Orthodox Cathedral in Vancouver, British Columbia from September 1st, 2019 until November 26, 2020. Uh, and then with the blessings of Metropolitan Methodius of Boston, Father Odysseus is now serving at St. Nectario's Greek Orthodox Church in Rosendale, Mass. since January 4th, 24th, 2021. Father uh, Odysseus and his wife Maria have a son Thomas, uh, and Father Odysseus has done an excellent job in my district uh, with St. Nectario's Church as uh, a pillar of our community in Rosendale and holding it together uh, during a very difficult time for all. Uh, I'm speaking, obviously, of the COVID pandemic in which uh, we are still uh, grappling. Uh, he has been a, a fixture in his short time there, and I look forward to uh, seeing him continue to be a positive uh, pillar of light in our community. And so with that, I'd like to invite Father Odysseus. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 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 Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I wanted to begin, before I begin with our prayer, I wanted to simply express my deepest gratitude and appreciation to Councillor Arroyo and all the respected members of Council. Uh, being a clergyman who served for 27 years so far, I understand the pressures and the demands as well as the commitment that is called upon when we are in these leadership roles. And it is such a blessing and a privilege to, to have these roles. At this time, I invite you to please rise as we pray. In 
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, the God of our salvation, who alone works wonders, look upon us with mercy and compassion, and out of your enduring love, hear us and have mercy on us. In all humility, we pray to you and entreat you, who are the source of wisdom, and thank you for all our people who serve in leadership roles. Our Mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu, our City Council members, their staff, and all their families. Enlighten and guide our leaders with reminders each day of why they decided to dedicate their lives to public service and use that commitment to encourage them. Direct, O oh Lord, their thoughts to the way of truth so that they may enact, order, and enforce whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, tending toward all excellence and virtue. We pray, O oh Lord, for the staff of our leaders. Grant also unto them love, grace, strength, and encouragement. Bless them with the knowledge needed to approach each situation in the best way possible. For you are the help and salvation of all of those who place their hope in you. And to you we offer praise, honor, and glory, now and forever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. God bless. Thank you. And if you're able to rise, please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge Thank you, Father, and thank you. Thank you, Council Arroyo. At this time, we have a special presentation um, from Council Bork, as she has invited the longtime community activist, Jackie Royce, to the council meeting today. Jackie is turning 89, so I want to ask Council Bork to um, introduce um, Jackie for us. Thank you so much, Councilor Flynn, and thank you for your indulgence in that Jackie lives right on the line between our districts. So. Um, you can consider this a mutual presentation. Um, I want to welcome uh, Jackie Royce and her family up today. Um, uh, Jackie is a, a tireless climate activist um, in my district, and uh, and just you know meeting her was one of the uh, most amazing parts of uh, my campaign back in 2019. And then I, honestly, one of the worst days in 2019 was when um, I heard that she'd uh, been hit by a car, and we thought for a minute we might have lost her, and she had a, a long um, and arduous recovery in the hospital, and then came back, and then somehow redoubled her efforts, which if you had known her before, um, just all the work she does with the Gas Leak Allies, BCAN, NAB, the Green Committee, the Ward 4 Democrats, some of whom are here, you, if you had known Jackie before, you would not have thought it was possible to redouble your efforts, and yet somehow it was. Um, and and even at now the age of 89. Um, she's also the uh, co-founder of the Boston Clean Energy Coalition and the Muddy Water Initiative, um, and, uh, and is just, um, it's just one of the most inspiring community activists I know in the city. And so we really wanted, um, and uh, thank you to the partnership with, of the Ward 4 Democrats, um, we wanted to present this, res this resolution today, recognizing Jackie Royce on her 89th birthday and a lifetime of uh, climate advocacy um, in which she really continues to inspire us all. So um, I, uh, I wanted to uh, invite the council and also her family. She's joined here by her son, Ethan, but also her daughters, Sarah and Francine. Um, and Carol, on behalf of Ward 4, I think you should come up too. And I, I wanted to ask counselors um, indulgence in joining us for a celebratory photo with Jackie and her family. Thank you.
Thank you, Councillor Block, and thank you to Jackie. And on behalf of the council, we want to wish you a happy, happy birthday. M Mr. Clerk, will you please let the record reflect that Councillor Fernandez Anderson is pre present? Yes. So Approval, we're on to the approval of the minutes. Seeing and hearing no discussion on the matter, the chair moves to approve the minutes from the last meeting as presented. All those in favor of approving the minutes from the last meeting say aye. aye. All opposed, nay. The, the ayes have it. Thank you. The minutes of the last meeting stand as approved. Communication from her honor, the mayor. Mr. Clerk. Please read docket 0577 and 0578 together, please. Docket number 0577, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Greg Wilmot as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health for a term expiring January 15, 2025. And docket number 0578, message in order for the confirmation of the appointment of Sandro Galeas as a member of the Boston Public Health Commission's Board of Health for a term expiring January 6, 2024. Thank you, docket 0577 and docket 0578 will be referred to the Committee on Public Health, Homelessness and Recovery, reports of public offices and others. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0579 to 0586. Docket number 0579, notice was received from the Mayor of the appointment of Renee Bushy as the Director of the Office of Labor Relations effective April 23rd, 2022. Docket number 0580. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Inez Foster as a member of the Make Boston Shine Trust Fund. Docket number 0581. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Brianna Millor as a member of the Make Boston Shine Trust Fund. Docket number 0582. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of John Romano as a member of the Make Boston Shine Trust Fund. Docket number 0583. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Henry Santana as a member of the Make Boston Shine Trust Fund. Docket number 0584. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Kevin Tran as the member of the Make Boston Shine Trust Fund. And docket number 0585. Notice was received from the mayor of the appointment of Tiffany Chu as Chief of Staff, effective April 18, 2022. And docket number 0586, communication was received from the mayor providing a list of the fiscal 2022 reallocations prior to April 15, 2022. Thank you. Docket 0579 through 0586 will be placed on file. Matters recently heard for possible action. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0480 to 0482, docket 0483, and docket 0484 to 0486. Together, please. Docket numbers 0480 through 0482. Orders for the fiscal year 23 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits, UPED. Docket number 0483, order for a capital fund transfer appropriations. And dockets 0484 through 0486, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson, chair of the Committee on Ways and Means. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the Committee on Ways and Means began holding hearings to review the FY23 budget this past um, Monday or J April 25th, 2022. We have um, held eight public hearings in total so far this week. We have held a total of um, two public hearings on um, for listening sessions for public testimonies. Um, and also a budget work workshop for uh, District 7 and 1 coming up for um, all of the districts. On Monday, May 2nd, we, ha we heard the Boston Public Schools this time to, um, on enrichment 
in the morning and social emotional learning and student supports in the afternoon. Um, BPS enrichment will also be sending in their written responses to the questions that um, on equity that were submitted prior to the hearing, um, as well as possible um, extending the hearing uh, to get the answers to questions that were not um, received. Um, tomorrow, Thursday, May 5th, we will again hear from BPS, um, this time on topic of operations in the morning and in the afternoon, we'll hear from the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services and Office of Language and Communications um, Access. Over the next five weeks, uh, we, will be c we will continue to review the FY23 budget with departmental hearings and counselor working sessions to discuss potential amendments. Um, if you should need or the counselors uh, need any um, information on schedule, working sessions, a form will go out. Um, I had received support from um, Councillor Bach uh, on form um, to ask the counselors for their um, priorities on the budget and moving forward to um, uh, to work in sessions with those. So looking forward to that. And um, again, thank you for, to all the counselors who's been attending. We've been having a very um, robust attendance and participation and look forward to more. I um, recommend that these matters remain in committee. Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Docket 04802048 Docket 0483, docket 0484 to 0486 will remain in, in committee. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0503 to 0504 and 0436 together, please. Docket number 0503, message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of 349 million five hundred thousand dollars in the form of a grant awarded by the United States Department of Treasury to be administered by the City of Boston's Chief Financial Officer, Collector Treasurer. This grant payment is made from the Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery from Fund, SLFRF, in the Treasury of the United States, established by Section 9901 of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, ARPA. Pursuant to the requirements of ARPA, the grant payment would fund COVID-19 response and recovery efforts and accelerate a Green New Deal for Boston through once-in-a-generation transformative investments that address the systemic health and economic challenges in the areas of affordable housing, economic opportunity and inclusion, behavioral health, climate and mobility, arts and culture, and early childhood. Docket number 0504. Message in order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend the amount of $40 million in the form of a grant awarded by the United States Department of the Treasury to be administered by the City of Boston's Chief Financial Officer, Collector Treasurer. The grant payment is made from the Coronavirus State and Local Fiscal Recovery Fund, CLFRF, in the Treasury of the United States established by Section 9901 of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, R ARPA. Pursuant to the requirements of the ARPA, the grant payment would fund provisions of government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue of such state, territory, or tribal government due to the COVID-19 public health emergency relative to revenues collected in the most recent full fiscal year of the state territory or tribal government prior to the emergency. And docket number 0436, order for a hearing on the state of Boston's non-governmental, nonprofit, social sector and char charting a post-pandemic recovery. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes uh, Councilor Bach, chair of the committee on Boston's COVID-19 recovery. Councilor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the councillors who came to our hearing yesterday afternoon, including Councillor Flynn, Braden, Baker, Murphy, Flaherty, Fernandez Anderson, Worrell, uh, Mejia, and uh, Lou Jen. Um, it was a, a good uh, first introduction to the administration's proposal on the American Rescue Plan funds, $350 million. So Casey Brock Wilson, um, Jim Williamson of the Budget Office, uh, and Chief Mary Angelis Solis-Severa all joined us from the administration. Um, as we discussed at that hearing, 
it was really just a kind of first overview of what they're proposing. And then, as I've mentioned a few times, my intention is to have a series of more kind of topic focused ones where we both talk about the details of their proposals in different categories like housing, public health, et cetera, but also put next to it the things that counselors have been filing and talk about the details of those and kind of hash out what makes sense from this body's perspective since this really is this transformational one-time funding that we're getting and it's got to be an agreement between the council and the mayor as to what the most impactful way to spend it is. Um, so that was the first hearing in a process. We also um, noticed it, uh, as the clerk mentioned, on um, the $40 million revenue replacement docket that's really supporting the budget uh, that's in Councillor Cornett Anderson's committee. Um, and, uh, and then, as well, um, heard from a number of nonprofit leaders on the docket that Councillor Braden had proposed about sort of what the role of the nonprofit ecosystem should be um, in this space. And in particular, thinking about what are the ways that our funding and the program that we set up could. Um, could really strengthen the nonprofit sector as it recovers. Uh, and I think there was some really good conversation about that, recognizing that the city doesn't have money to bail out the nonprofit sector here, um, but are there ways that in our contracting with the nonprofit sector in terms of like making things intentionally available um, to smaller nonprofits, and then that really like thinking about how the quality of the jobs that we have um, that we're supporting with these contracts and agreements look like, could we help transform that sector to one um, that's more sustainable for the people who work in it and the people uh, that it serves. So I think it was a really robust, good conversation. Um, it was, and I want to thank in particular Councillor Braden since she was the sponsor of that third docket. Um, but it was very much the beginning of the conversation. Um, my uh, my office will have out uh, today or tomorrow morning um, our draft information request from questions that councillors asked. But if councillors have any questions that you'd like to add on to that, um, you can write back to our office with that. Um, so we're going to try to wrangle that all by the end of the day, Friday, so that we can send it over, so that we can make sure that we've got the right information in hand in advance of the next hearing with the administration. Um, we're also in the midst of nailing down, and we'll hopefully have nailed down by Friday, the exact schedule of those upcoming hearings so that people can know. Um, but what I would encourage in the meantime is that um, colleagues continue to do what what folks have been doing, I think, including in the agenda today, which is if there's something that you want put alongside the proposal and to talk about as a use of ARPA funds, file it in the council docket um, with that mention of ARPA funds in the title so that we know um, that that's the conversation you're trying to participate in. Um, and, uh, and we'll definitely be uh, figuring out how to make sure that the time in those subsequent hearings is not just about the administration's proposals, it really is about um, what councillors are proposing and uh, I'm, I'm excited to keep hashing that out together. So thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I will ask that the dockets all three remain in committee. Thank you, Council Block. Docket 0503. I'm sorry. The chair, the chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would like to thank the, the chair of the um, of the of the committee for, for holding this and and to um, listen to us and our concerns. Uh, I made mine quite clear yesterday. I don't really see anything in here that speaks to mental health other than what's happening down on Mass and Cass. And I believe we do need investments down there, but I don't think we need to invest in buying things like the Roundhouse Hotel and things like that. I think we should be investing in our young kids that are going to bear the brunt of this, um, of this what's happened to us the last two years, everything that's happened there, it's young kids. Just look at what's going on in our schools, the violence and the misbehaviors that are happening in our schools. It's all mental health driven. And I don't see one thing in this $350 million that speaks to that, to speaks to youth development. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Baker. The Chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I also want to thank um Councillor Bach for her leadership and, and chairing the committee hearing yesterday and allowing us to add our uh, docket to the hearing uh, to look at Boston's non-governmental, non-profit uh, social sector um, and how they, and hear from representatives of that sector and how they're fared during the pandemic. It's really, um, it was a timely reminder that our non-profit sector are essential partners for the city in delivering um, essential services in the sphere of housing and uh, mental health and so, uh, health and human services all across the board. We have 200,000 
residents of Boston are actually employed in this sector. And very uh, many of our smaller nonprofits um, d dug into their uh, financial reserves and in the, in the early days of COVID um, to meet the, meet the need, thinking it would be a short-term challenge. It wasn't a sprint, it turned out to be a marathon, actually probably a super marathon, longer than the 26 miles. So, um, you know, I think it was a timely um, conversation and I do hope that we will continue to consider how we might support the nonprofit sector as we uh, uh, consider how we might uh, expend our ARPA funds going forward. Um, t targeted and mindful uh, expenditure in, in certain things will, will actually give us a lot more benefit going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Braden. The Chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Yes, uh, thank you to the Chair and to the sponsors for bringing this um, very important conversation to our chamber yesterday. I just would like to go on the record and echo the importance of making sure that we as counselors understand and recognize the important role that we play in determining how these dollars are going to get allocated and used. Um, I always say that nothing about us without us is for us. And when we get presented um, things that we need to react to, um, it always feels like an afterthought. And in the spirit of a new administration and in the spirit of collaboration, I think that we have an opportunity to change the way we do business and making sure that we're listening directly, not, to, not only to our, the, our council colleagues, but also to those who put us in this position. So I look forward to the continued conversation and being a loud voice in this um, process. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, um, Council President. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for holding the hearing and uh, to my colleagues for their expressed concerns. And I think that, you know, we, we, we have a long way to go in terms of like procurement and con city contracts and ma managing BRJP and ensuring that these processes or uh, how we're contracting or employing people in the city of Boston is um, or not equitable. So I, I did hear that there was a plan for specific allocation to ensure to fulfill some assessments um, thereafter or some sort of metrics in monitoring how we're going to be um, equitable or how the implementation of these programs would be equitable. Um, I did appreciate the, the ideas that the administration had. I, I think they're, uh, I think that's uh, most of them for, for um, are wonderful ideas. But I also think that counselors have wonderful ideas. I also think that counselors have been planning and organizing um, and meeting and working and galvanizing and spending a lot of time in organizing toward their own um, projects or consolidation of community efforts. So I believe that we should probably go into conversations about how we are um, expanding on the proposal to include us. Um, and so I look forward to that and I won't belabor this any further, but to say that again, uh, when we look at our contracts and our records, we're not doing a good job. So um, allocating such a large amount to projects and say, okay, here's five million to ensure that it is equitable, um, I think is concerning. And I think that historically, you know, the pattern so thus far historically, and I, and I know this doesn't speak to the administration currently, but because there is a lack of, of trust, because there, the relationship has not built upon where we as people of color or counselors of color believe or feel that um, the equity has truly been solidified in city government, then the honest and sincere conversation should roll out where we are included. So lead by example to speak to Council Mihir's point. So I look forward to doing that and having those open conversations without, um, without insult, without judgment, but to say, how are we doing this in the way that we say that we're supposed to be? Thank you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak? Docket 0503, 0504, and 0436 will remain in committee. <coughs> Motions, orders, and resolutions, Mr. Quirk. Please read docket 0587. Docket number 0587, Councilors Lara and Fernanda Sanderson offer the following. Order for a hearing to discuss the impact of inequitable housing code enforcement and Boston's proactive rental inspection program. 
Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to Councilor Fernandez Anderson for co-sponsoring this matter with me. Um, we all know that uh, asthma is a chronic respiratory um, disease that's responsible for about 1.8 million uh, annual emergency department visits in the U.S. It's also the leading cause of childhood morbidity. Um, it is a pre-existing condition that we have seen exacerbate COVID-19, increasing the risk of hospitalization and death um, disproportionately for black and brown people in the city of Boston. And housing has been shown, and housing quality in particular, has been shown to be critical determinant of asthma, particularly for children with more, excuse me, with more than 44% of the risk of childhood asthma diagnosis being attributed to exposure at home. In 2013, the city of Boston passed the proactive rental inspection ordinance, which implemented a proactive rental inspection program that requires owners of all non-exempt units to undergo in inspection every five years. Last month, Harvard released a 10-year study of our housing code enforcement, specifically for reported asthma triggers which showed a 17% longer median response time, 14% higher probability of cases being overdue, and a 54.4% lower probability of repair in neighborhoods that have the lowest proportion of white residents in the city. We know that renters typically are slow to report this type of incident for fear of retaliation, and so we can expect that the number of people that are living in private rental <coughs> units um, and are being exposed to asthma triggers are much more significant than what we see here. Um, I believe that there's really an urgent need to strengthen code enforcement systems and programs like Breathe Easy at Home and the Proactive Rental Inspection Program if we want to protect the health and safety of our tenants, particularly in the city's most marginalized communities. Uh, as the chair of the Committee on Housing and Community Development, I'm committing to ensuring that our constituents not only have access to um, ample affordable housing, but that the places that they call home are also safe and healthy. I'm calling this hearing because our current interventions have proven to be plagued by the same systemic racism that we see in all of our city agencies. And I think that a policy failure is gonna require a policy solution and I hope that we can get to one here. Thank you, President Flynn. Thank you, thank you, Council Lara. Um, the chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Council President. Thank you, um, Councilor Lara for, Lara, for um, inviting me and uh, ask and, and inviting me to partner with you in this. Um, so I guess just to reiterate, uh, not what, what, sh what hasn't been said, right? So um, you put that so eloquently. Um, in short, I think if you live in predominantly black um, neighborhood, because of the intersection between like, you know, systemic racism and class inequality, that neighborhood is more likely to be poor working class. So um, then, obviously um, predominantly white neighborhood, then they are predominantly white neighborhood counterpart. And I think because of this, to reiterate the example documented here, though we could just as easily discuss other examples, um, obviously asthma and other um, conditions that come with uh, lack of um, <coughs> inspections in, in these communities, obviously impact uh, the communities disproportionately in a negative way. Um, so thank you again, and I look forward to um, holding the hearing with you. Thanks. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? Uh, the chair rec recognizes Council Eugen. Council Eugen, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise in support of this document, but also to say that one of the reasons why it's incredibly important to have ISD doing these inspections is because people are so afraid already to withhold rent when it is their right, when they're not being provided a t uh, 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 an apartment that is up to standards. Um, we see it time and time again, people are paying for, ha for apartments that are not quality, right? But they feel like if they don't pay the rent, even though they're not getting heat or even though they're you know, you know, living in subpar conditions, that they're still required to pay rent when they're not. They are required, they, they're able to withhold rent. And the more we get ISD out there to inspect the apartments, the more people will feel empowered that they can actually withhold that rent. That they can, um, uh, and, and so I think it's important that we have ISD out there also so that our neighborhoods, uh, people in our neighborhoods feel like they can take ownership, even if they're just renting, of what's coming out of their pocket, and that what's coming out of their pocket meets the value of what they're getting. So just rise in support, and I think this was a really important conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Council Jen. The, the chair recognizes Council Rell. Council Rell, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to the makers, Council Lara and Anderson. Um, the hearing order points to some staggering data around 
repairing items that are health ha hazards. Um, have received pictures of unhealthy living, living situations from rodents, cockroaches, and mold. Um, as a city, I believe that we should be um, looking towards a more proactive enforcement that's not, that does not rely on tenant reports. Um, for example, in 2003, the Greensboro City Council enacted uh, their own certificate occupancy ordinance and requiring mandatory inspections for essentially all rental housing. And after they enacted um, their ordinance, they saw that code violations dropped by 77% in eight years, and that the city was uh, able to bring more than 8,700 properties up to a min minimum standard over the course of four years. I'm looking forward to working with the, um, the makers, ISD, uh, to ensure that um, their resources um, and that we're able to enforce and strengthen the policies on inspection and repair. Thank you. Thank you. And you want your name added? Council Absolutely. Council? The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I also want to thank the makers for this very important um, hearing order. Um, and it also dovetails very nicely with uh, some work our office has been doing on the issue of um, uh, scofflaw um, landlords who uh, do not uh, keep their properties up to cold and um, defer maintenance and et cetera without, uh, and use the, the cold enforcement uh, fines as just a, a cost of doing business. So we're working on that. The other issue uh, that we are addressing in this context with regard to that um, issue is looking at the capacity of our inspectional services department and making sure that they have the technology uh, that, um, to actually um, be more effective in enforcing the codes. Uh, um, and, and my understanding has been that you know they have been using basically a paper and a pencil and paper, a pen and a paper approach, and that they do that um, the addition of added. Uh, technology such as iPads uh, so that they can do a, a field report in the field and have photographs and log the conditions uh, will expedite and be much more effective in enforcement. So um, always with any of these questions, I, on, I echo your concerns, Mr. President. Um, we, when we bring in new rules, new ma uh, mandates, it's really important to ensure that our uh, inspection services department is equipped and has the reg has the appropriate level of personnel to be able to be effective enforcers of the code. So thank you so much. Thank you, Council and Braden. And please you add my name. Thank you, Council Braden. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia. Yes. You so thank you, uh, Mr. President. So I just want to rise in support um, and thank the leadership of uh, the housing committee uh, for spearheading this, Council Lada, for your unrelentless. Uh, leadership and all things that deal with housing. I really do appreciate and love how you lead in this space, as well as uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, really looking forward to um, the work and uh, not only just having the conversation, but really putting in the uh, systems that are going to help support um, your vision. So please add my name, thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Anyone else like to speak or add their name? I, I will. Add, I will. I want to say thank you to the the makers of this important hearing order. I also want to highlight what Councilor Worrell mentioned: um, the important role pest control plays in healthy living in in apartments, especially. Um, but they contribute significantly to um, decline in our public health, our, our our health for our children. So dealing with pest control is also a critical. Role. I know several of my counselors have mentioned that, but that's an important, um, an important subject. And I just want to thank all of the counselors for the important work they're doing on this. Um, if you'd like to add, in, if you'd like to add your name, please raise um, raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Lujan, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy, Councilor Rao. Please add the chair. Docket 0587 will be assigned to the Committee on City Services and Innovation Technology. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0588, please. Docket number 0588, Councilors Lara and Fernandez Anderson offer the following, in order for a hearing to discuss the Malcolm X Park renovation. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor Lara. Councilor Lara, <coughs> you have the floor. Thank you again, President Flynn. Um, the Malcolm X Park is currently undergoing an $8 million uh, renovation, and due to 
conflicting community concerns, <laughs> to put it lightly, over the design and the tree removal. The city has paused on the work on the project. This project is about two months behind schedule, and we're calling this hearing to share an overview of the community process, the decisions that we made based on the feedback we got from our community meetings, and to hear from community members who live in the neighborhood and use the park about their ideas and their concerns. We hope that this is a second attempt at integrating their feedback uh, that will allow us to get back on schedule so the people of Roxbury can enjoy their brand new space as it was intended. The Committee on Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks will be stewarding this conversation with the support of my co-sponsor, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, um, where whose district the park um, is in, uh, Chief White Hammond, and Commissioner Woods, and we're looking to hold a hearing um, soon in the coming week. Thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to uh, Councilor Lara for, again, partnering with me or inviting me to um, in the lead of this. Um, we, in, in District 7, there's been um, a series of community hearings and different listening sessions with the parks. and. Um, I'd also like to thank you, thank uh, Chief uh, Mariama as well as uh, Commissioner Woods for the process thus far. It's come to a point where people feel that there needs to be a, a further, um, I guess, democratic process, and um, I just, I'm just really um, excited about this because this is a true example of how um, the go government should work, and um, just uh, really grateful that uh, Councilor Lara brought it to my attention to handle it um, in the chambers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden, Councilor Flaherty, Councilor Eugene, Councilor Mejia, Councilor Murphy. Council, we're all please add the chair as well. Um, docket 0588 will be assigned to the Committee on Environmental Justice, Resiliency, and Parks. Mr. Clerk, please read, please read docket 0589. Docket number 0589. Councilor Mejia offered the following order for a hearing on diversifying cannabis business models. The Chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. In November of 2016, the voters of Massachusetts made it clear that we needed to create a process to allow the sale of legalized rec recreational cannabis. The spirit of that moment was rooted in the urgent need to undo decades of racism and the overcriminalization of black and brown communities. It was a moment where we stood up and said that. If you are a single parent trying to sell some cannabis to make ends meet, you're not a, crim a criminal. In fact, we want to work with you and all communities that have been over-policed for using and selling cannabis to help you start a legal cannabis business. Four years after that, in March of 2020, Pure Oasis in Grove Hall became the first marijuana store to open in Boston, also becoming the first licensed marijuana business opened by the Cannabis Control Commission's Economic Empowerment Applicants, a program originally intended to offset the head start in the recreational market granted to existing medical dispensaries, which are nearly all whites owned. Even to get to the point where we had one equity applicant, stores in Boston took years of work, countless hours of advocacy, and let's face it, millions of dollars because that's what it takes to simply set up shop here in Boston. I have yet to meet a cannabis entrepreneur who has not spent at least $100,000 on leases, applications, bureaucracy, red tape, and more. And so you have to ask yourself, with such a high barrier to entry for cannabis entrepreneurs, could a single parent selling cannabis on the side um, really make their ends meet or even dream of opening up their own store? And that's why we're filing this hearing order today, because we need to think more creatively about how we're creating pathways to entrepreneurship in the cannabis market for communities that for decades were over-policed and over-incarcerated, and to this day still struggle to access the legal cannabis market. 
I would like to see a future where a cannabis entrepreneur can, in a safe and well-regulated system, produce edibles or other cannabis products in their own homes and make a living off of that. We already know that it's happening all across Boston as we speak, so we might as well find a way to make it safe and, and for everyone involved. I know that the people who are listening to this um, may think that it's crazy or even undoable because it's never been done before. But if we are serious about championing black and brown cannabis entrepreneurs, we need to think about all of the entrepreneurs, not just the ones who have access to capital. I know that our cannabis laws are complicated, delicate, and I also know that we still have some of, some of the counselors who were there when the law was, was first crafted, including my colleague, Counselor Flaherty, who championed the half mile buzzer um, buffer rule that is now in law in our city. I'm going to into this conversation with an open mind and I hope that my colleagues will do the same. And I think it's really important for us to really recognize what this moment um, presents itself is as an opportunity for us to literally really think outside the box. Um, and I always say we need to have a can-do attitude and just because it hasn't been done doesn't necessarily mean it can't. And I think that this is an opportunity for us to really explore what it's gonna take um, to make it happen. And I hope that we all have the, um, the courage um, to do that. Um, everyone is watching us. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Council Baker. Council, you. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the, the sponsor referenced legislation about the home kitchens. I've had multiple restaurant owners ask me for help on that, where it started out as, oh, it, it'll be craft jams and things like that that we'll sell at farmer's markets. Well, I've been shown Facebook posts where people co-opt a full menu from restaurants, immigrant-owned restaurants too, by the way, and say, we can do anything on this, catering all the way down the line. So it's basically become a way for people to stay away from uh, health care, health inspections, to stay away from any sort of taxes, to stay away from any sort of regulation that we have to keep people safe, that's one point. And to talk about allowing people to make edibles in their own homes, edibles is where you need to, you need to really know what's in there, really know the dosage, because that's where people can really get wacky if they eat too many edibles, or if the edible says it's five milligrams and it's actually 50 milligrams, and I don't think home, home cooks, home chemists, sh we, should, we should give that sort of, um, that sort of, like, ability to do that. You know, I, I mean, are we just gonna allow everyone to just sell weed now? To, at what point, do we have, have and continue the rules that we have in place? I mean, there's a reason why it costs a lot. I, for one, don't want weed on every, on every corner because it's no different from the liquor, liquor stores. What have we fought for years? Liquor stores on billboards, liquor, liquor being sold in all of our neighborhoods, my neighborhoods, every, every corner, liquor store. And that's what the weed industry has been in Boston here. We've just licensed um, dispensary, so we're just selling weed to our kids. No jobs, we have no, I think we have one, one grow coming, which is where the real jobs are. There's no labs in Boston. I don't know of any manufacturing. There's nothing creating jobs. All we're doing is selling weed, and I think this will just make it worse, so I do not wish to sign on. Thank you, Council Baker. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Please raise your, he raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Arroyo. Please add Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Please add Councilor Lara. Please add Councilor Lujan. Please add Councilor Worrell. Please add the chair. Docket 0589 will be referred to small business and professional licenses. Mr. Clerk. Please read docket 0590. Docket number 0590, Councilors Fernandez Anderson and Murphy offer the following. Order for a hearing to discuss ways in which ARPA funding can support an ecosystem for nonprofit holistic wraparound health services for disenfranchised populations. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Councilor Fernandez Anderson, 
You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And um, Mr. Uh, Clerk, when I, when I was writing this, the title read like that, just the way you read it. And I was like, the non holistic heparin health <laughs> services. So I was like, I was really uh, enjoying the way you read that because that's exactly how it played in my mind. I was uh -huh. like, dang, this title is too long. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, just the title. I, listen, I'm gonna listen. You know what? It's a dissertation. No, okay. <laughs> it's four pages long. Yes. Um, I know. Listen. Um, right. Y'all, leave me alone. Um, <laughs> if I can, if I, if I can um, add uh, Councilor Lujan um, as original co-sponsor as well, Mr. Uh, President. Yes, uh, Councilor Lujan is, is so ordered. Thank you. Mr. Clark, please add Councilor Lujan. All right, all jokes aside, um, we hear Council Mejia talking about this all the time, and I don't know, the, I don't know how to quote you, but um, Boston is resource, resource but coordination poor. And so imagine an ecosystem that, and I think this is already in play, this is not something that I'm just pulling out of a hat, um, but imagine, because I do that a lot, but imagine though an ecosystem that is actually uh, working in synergy in terms of the uh, health services or wraparound services. A lot of us talk about mental health or behavior health, and I think that understanding the scope of it, I think even bringing um, training to the council, understanding the scope of like what preventative measures would look like in terms of wraparound services to address mental health is super important. So an ecosystem of all of these health services that are working together um, in collaboration with uh, one, one nonprofit that is serving as the hub or the connector. So in any type of uh, health, you need the coordinator or the umbrella, if you will, of these services so that if I'm going for substance abuse or substance misuse rather um, services and I need housing that there is an automatic network that you can plug me to so that it actually is wraparound. So that if I go for myself and my child needs help, and but then you're also working with my uncle or you're working with my grandma that may need elderly housing or something like that. That is what we call in the um, trauma-informed uh, world uh, or services wraparound. That you are working with the full family or you're working with the full community in terms of holistic services. I think that there are a lot of agencies in our community that have proven best practices, that have actually implemented services in a very practical and efficient way. And I think it's war it warrants a conversation for us to talk about how are we looking at all of our resources and creating this so-called ecosystem. And I do have to say, um, Council Braden, um, I was not I was not motivated by your idea, but then because I wasn't really listening when you were breaking it down. So I apologize that this goes into specifics of your idea. Um, and I came to see you today to say, like, hey, look, oh my God, great minds think alike, but this is an actual more specific to, um, to it, and as an extension to what you have brought up already. And I would love to collaborate in how we can fuse this together. And that's um, pretty much all I have to say about that. Thanks. Thank you, Council Fernandez. <laughs> Fernandez Anderson, uh, the chair recognizes uh, Council Lujan. Council Lujan, you have the floor. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the chair recognizes Council Murphy. Council Murphy, you thank have you. the floor. Thank you, um, and thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, for asking me to join on. And I do just have to say that it took a few days to read through it. <laughs> <laughs> My office kept saying, did you read it yet? I'm like, I'm halfway through, but I think I'm on board. So thank you for um, this work, because we know it's so important. And so I will just state that, you know, we always need to support our nonprofits all the time, but especially through this pandemic and through the recovery that we'll be going through for a long time. And the mental health crisis is one of the pandemics within the pandemic, and we know so many are struggling. And we had a hearing yesterday where we heard from the nonprofits and what we already knew was really shared more eloquently about the staffing is another crisis that so many of our nonprofit social service industry are struggling through. They've been hit the hardest. You know, they've been stepping up and providing these supports, the much needed supports to keep our city moving forward. When we shut down, they were all out there on the front line 
and they needed to work more and they have a staffing shortage and we know that we don't pay our social service workers the pay that they need and they deserve. They also have been pivoting to ensure that our communities get the necessary services they need and I know we hope COVID's over, but we know it's not, and so many of our neighbors and residents not just need mental health services, but also basic services like food and heat and housing still, so we can't forget that. So I believe that this order is going to help mainstream and ensure that the much needed services continue to get to the families in our city, so I look forward to the work ahead and partnering with you on this and also with Councilor Braden, because I, I feel like, um, most of the orders that have been filed in Council of Flaherty and Baker, uh, those who have been around, it, it might seem like we keep kind of filing the same things. It seems like we care about the same thing. So moving forward, maybe we should work, you know, we continue to work together, but in a way where we know that we're not in any way trying to step on each other's toes, but get this important work done for the city. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council Murphy. The chair recognizes Council Jen. Council Jen, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and may the fourth be with you. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. My staff, I want to make sure I made sure I said it on the mic. I said it. Right. Um, I want to thank um, the leadership of Councilor Fernand Anderson and uh, Councilor Murphy on this issue. I'm happy to be added. We know that nonprofits engaged in COVID-19 um, and health recovery services are already doing the work. In, in the communities um, that we live in and that they serve. I um, mean, if you don't know that these nonprofits are doing the work, um, you're not looking hard enough uh, because they're there, they're present oftentimes using money um, from their own pockets. I'm helping uh, a nonprofit leader who's been, who's been pouring herself into this work of uh, really shepherding her nonprofit through the not, throughout COVID and is re behind on some, on some of her housing payments uh, because she's poured so much of her own funds into this work, so they need our support. Um, as Councilor Fernando Anderson said, wraparound services provide comprehensive and holistic family-driven solutions to health services. It puts the individual youth and families um, right at the center. COVID relief funds have been almost um, completely in in inaccessible to our immigrant communities, to our undocumented communities, um, to returning citizens, and I share the Civil Rights Committee and Immigrant Advancement Committee. Um, I wanna make sure that everything we do is in partnership with those who it's, it's has become and has historically been easy for us to exclude. Um, so we need to make sure that they're getting the resources they need so that they can share in the prosperity of the city. Um, we know that oftentimes providing a housing voucher or job training uh, will not solve the underlying problem because people are complex and you know the, the, the needs are, 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 are very varied. Um, and I think nonprofits oftentimes are doing, meeting people at all of their various needs. Um, I think about, you know, with the work of IFSI, the Brazilian Worker Center, Equity Now and Beyond, Acidon, La Alianza, so many uh, nonprofits out there um, that are doing the work sometimes out of their own kitchen. Um, and this is especially the case when it comes to black and brown nonprofits that don't have the advantage of networking, of structures, and of access. And so I'm incredibly excited to support the work of Councilor Fernandez Anderson of making sure that we are building ecosystems that work and that are responsive and working in partnership uh, with the people who are already doing the work. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I look forward to the work. Thank you, Councilor Jean. Is anyone else looking to speak on this matter? The chair recognizes Councilor Braden. Councilor Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, for this um, initiative. Um, you know, just, I think the connection and the building of networks and effective uh, effective uh, coalition building across different uh, nonprofits that do different parts of the job, having uh, having a safety net uh, and a network that actually doesn't have big holes in it, and when we see the holes, being able to to, to correct the the deficiencies. Uh, I just want to speak to something that happens out in Alston Brighton. We have the Alston Brighton Health Collaborative, and it is a very loose uh, coalition of folks who from a, a wide range of, of non-profit entities in our neighborhood. There's about 40 organizations all together, and uh, they worked together pre-COVID, but when COVID hit, um, they, um, the coordinator, the executive director, had a, had a multiple, tr several times a week COVID 
networking meeting so that we pulled all our resources together and connected. And that, that network includes the Brazilian Workers' Center, the, the Brazilian Women's Center, uh, ABCD, St. Elizabeth Hospital, the whole, the whole range and the, the community health centers. And it was really about, okay, what does anybody need? What's going on on the ground? How can we get better, more resources? And it was really that sort of um, collaborative approach that helped us weather the storm. And, um, you know, I think we need to explore more models of that. I know at a neighborhood level, every neighborhood organizes and does this but it's maybe formalizing it and putting some re more resources into it. Um, these, organ th these networks, these informal neighborhood networks, uh, formalizing them more and putting some resources into supporting that. Grassroots, neighborhood level, uh, wraparound interventions is, is really something we probably should be looking at very, very carefully. So thank you so much for this um, hearing order and uh, please add my name. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you to the makers for bringing this hearing order to the space. Really super excited about the conversation. As someone who um, always talks about the fact that I started my career in the nonprofit sector, and that's all I've ever known, aside from my time at MTV. And even then, I was still working with the nonprofit sector um, in different capacities. I think that, you know, when I talk about our ability to be uh, resourceful, oftentimes those who have the most access to information are the ones who usually get the most dollars and also are the ones that have the most capacity. But the ones who are doing the work oftentimes are overlooked. And I think creating an ecosystem where, where we're all really recognizing the strength, um, we're not going to be acting like you know, crabs in a battle, always fighting for whatever little resources and whatever crumbs that we can get. So I think this whole idea of really creating an ecosystem that creates opportunities for people to be in collaboration with, not in competition with each other, will really help um, us get at the core of a lot of the issues that we have um, relied on our nonprofit sector to um, lean into. And I'll just say that, you know, I know that this is specifically for established nonprofits. I'd just like to add that our office has been doing a lot of work with mutual aid groups um, who are looking for uh, organizations to partner up with. And I think that when we think about building capacity, there are a lot of folks who are doing the work right out of their homes um, with very limited resources. And so our hope um, through this conversation, and we hope to bring some of these mutual aid groups into the into the fold, um, we're going to be hosting a capacity building conference in July um, to help support these organizations. And so look forward to having the hearing before then so that we can learn how we can better support everyone. So thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. If you'd like to add your name, please raise your hand. Mr. Clark, please add Council Arroyo, Council Baker, Council Bach, Council Braden, Council Flaherty, Council Lara. Council Mejia, Councilor Murphy, Council Orell, please add the chair. Docket 0590 will be referred to the Committee on Boston's COVID-19 Recovery. Mr. Clerk, please read Docket 0591. Docket number 0591, Councilor Flaherty offered the following. Order requesting certain information under Section 17F relative to the Mission Hill K-8 through School. The Chair recognizes Council of Flaherty. Council of Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Move for a suspension and passage of the 17F. Council of Flaherty seeks suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0591. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0592. Docket number 0592. Councilors Mejia, Lara, and Arroyo offer the following. Resolution recognizing November 20th through December 20th, 2022 as National Survivors of Homicide Awareness Month. Thank you. The Chair recognizes Councilor, Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. And before I even read this, I just wanted to acknowledge Councilor Worrell and Councilor Baker uh, for bringing the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute here a few weeks ago. So really do appreciate your support um, for Tina and her team. So thank you for bringing them into the space. Um, and I would also would like to thank my co-sponsors, Councilor Lara and Arroyo. 
I know this resolution will be recognizing um, Awareness Month all the way in November, but we frankly need to be recognizing survivors of homicide 365 days a year. We use the word quote unquote resilient in a lot of political spaces, um, perhaps sometimes too much, but it's hard to think of another word to describe the families and loved ones of those who have survived homicide. That kind of loss is pain that sticks um, to you like no other. And as we have recently um, seen in recent events that have happened with the graves of our young loved ones in our um, cemetery in Rosendale, that pain and trauma can renew itself over and over again. And I think that too often we lose a loved one to homicide. That's, um, that's the uh, initial wave of support. People send you meals, reach out, words of encouragement, refer you to trauma services, but what happens after that? What happens during that first birthday or holiday season without them? Who is there for the families in that time of need? And I think that's why we need a time like Survivors of Homicide Awareness Month because there isn't a moment in time when the grieving stops, when you finally move on, especially when you have lost someone to homicide as I have. This Sunday, I will be walking in the 26th annual Mother's Day Walk for Peace as a city councilor, but more importantly, as a mom. I need to be there not only to show my support, but because I know that we can't just keep having the same conversations around violence in our community. Something has to give um, so that by this time next year, the 27th annual Mother's Day Walk for Peace can be a place where we can celebrate the fact that we realized our potential as a city and make major systemic changes to how we address the violence in our communities. I really hope that we can get to this point. Um, and before I move to suspend the, the, um, the rules and ask my colleagues to speak, you know, I met, so Tina was my neighbor. Um, and when I started my career in the nonprofit sector, um, her son, Louis, was gunned down on Geneva Ave, not too far from where I live. And that was 20-something years ago. And we keep having the same conversation around violence. And I think that what we have lost um, touch is, is with the folks who have continued to carry on. Um, my niece uh, lost the, the father of her son to violence um, in my first year here as a city councilor. And his tomb was one of the ones that were, um, uh, were one of the ones that were um, messed with. And it was my daughter who told me about it. And I think that when we think about survivors and we think about the pain and the trauma, all of those things need to be taken into consideration if we're really serious about um, this work here in the city of Boston. I just feel like everything here is so political and it just gets tiring and our people are tired of it. And I think that, you know, we all are responsible and we all have to be held accountable to what we're going to do if we're really serious about restoring the harm that so many are experiencing here in the city of Boston. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you um, to Councilor Mejia for um, asking me to um, co-sponsor this um, resolution, or including me in this resolution, and Councilor Arroyo, um, our other co-sponsor. Uh, I became a homicide survivor for the first time when I was 11, when my oldest brother, who was 25 at the time, was murdered. Uh, I didn't know at the time that I would become a survivor another dozen times over uh, in, in, in my life. All of my colleagues, if not most of the folks here, have um, are either survivors themselves or know and love survivors and their families who they either work with or are in their communities. And so I feel like this resolution is an ode to that strength and that resilience uh, and the commitment to keep going from homicide survivors and for me, it's really a commitment to the ongoing fight against gun violence. Um, as a member of the trauma response team in JP, I spent most of my time responding to victims and survivors of penetrating wounds um, in my neighborhood 
I then became a street worker and did violence prevention and intervention work in Mattapan first, then in Lower Roxbury and the South End. And so to say that I have spent most of my adult and professional life um, in the midst uh, and trying to manage and fight for uh, and advocate for not just um, our young people who are victims, but their, their friends and families in our communities would be an understatement. Um, there are things happening in my district currently that um, you know the, the folks in our community are really feeling the weight of, including this issue uh, that we've been seeing at the cemeteries, uh, one of which is a constituent of ours in our office has been working really closely to support. And so you know when I think about survivors of homicide, I like to think about my mom who lost her you know lost her first child and how she dedicated, you know, her life, maybe for the possible next 10 years, to finding my brother's murderer, who wasn't arrested when my brother was shot. And that is the kind of tenacity that I see in all of our people, and all of our, and all of the faces of the people in the constituents of the city of Boston, who have to carry the weight of surviving homicide. So I'm really excited um, and happy to support this resolution, and I hope that we can continue to honor, honoring survivors by making the policy decisions that are ultimately gonna create safe communities for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. The Chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, President Flynn. Uh, I thank uh, Councilor Mejia and Councilor Lara uh, for raising this uh, with me. I had uh, a murder hit very close to my home, Rochelle Nova, uh, the pizza delivery man who was murdered in High Park. Uh, was the father at the time of my partner. Uh, and so I was there for the direct impact of that and for the years after that. It's actually how I became very aware of the services that the city offers and where they're good and where they're poor. Uh, I got to meet Courtney Gray at that time. I have to give him some praise in this moment uh, as somebody who uh, is excellent at dealing with trauma. Uh, and the reality is they only have the resources at that point for folks who don't know uh, Rochelle Nova was a pizza delivery man who uh, had taken a shift and that night was murdered uh, over essentially $50. Uh, and when that happens, uh, there's obviously a lot of trauma, residual trauma, a lot of uh, lifelong obvious pain and harm. Uh, and what the city was able to offer, which I think is you know, certainly better than nothing, was a week essentially of uh, Courtney Gray and, and sort of the trauma response team services. They got a week of that. And it was incumbent upon uh, myself and people close uh, to this family to basically ask them as many questions as we could to figure out how do you guide somebody through unspeakable loss and trauma, just the deepest, worst, destabilizing thing that can happen to someone. Uh, and with his guidance and his ability to be somebody I could check in with regularly, uh, there was healing there and, and there were things that were in play, um, but there's, there's still that loss, there's still that trauma, there's still residual. Uh, every holiday is very different, every birthday is very different, every uh, moment that would bring joy, uh, generally whether it's a graduation or a marriage proposal or however that is going, there is harm and loss and missing. Uh, and so to think about the families uh, in Boston uh, and, and in the state and in the country, experience that I think Homicide Awareness Month is, uh, or is, is the least of what we can do. Uh, I think focusing resources towards dealing with that trauma that families are feeling uh, in those moments. Uh, and I would just also note that this was a case where they were able to uh, arrest the folks who did this uh, and bring them through a judicial process. But we know that in Boston especially, many families have never had that closure. Many families have had to experience the feeling of not knowing uh, who did this to their loved one. Uh, and so as we do this, uh, you know, I just want to highlight that there are services that we have offered that I can uh, testify, frankly, work really well. Uh, and we need to expand that action and that practice and, and make that more accessible. Uh, the other thing I will just mention here, too, is that people don't often think about this, but when people are uh, die unexpectedly, but through, through murder or homicide, there is a cost that a family must now uh, carry uh, that is unexpected. And often uh, times it is devastating to have someone who has just lost someone and their first request uh, is for money or for help securing money because they are stressed 
uh, and worried about how they are going to uh, properly uh, honor their, their loved one because they don't have the resources to do so in this time of trauma and need. And I know that the city uh, does do some very small uh, allocations in the budget to help with those things, uh, but I think that is something that I would like to see focused on in the budget as well because it is heartbreaking to see families that do not have the uh, resources to make it day to day have to all of a sudden figure out how to get into debt or how to borrow money from other people so that they can honor their loved one while also going through such trauma. And so these are the kinds of wraparound things that I think we really have to focus on as a city and figure out how to address because homicide uh, is awful and terrible and there are all these sort of butterfly effects and ways in which we can be helpful uh, and I can speak to that personally. And so thank you uh, for lifting this up. Uh, I see all of those who have suffered this harm uh, and I, my thoughts and prayers, frankly, are with you uh, all of the time, but especially uh, now. So thank you, uh, President Flynn and the council. Thank you, Council Arroyo. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, please add my name and as the lead sponsor, um, it stated, uh, it really is uh, a year-round um, a year-round thought for, for families. I, I lost my cousin back in 1994. 28 years has gone by. We think about him. The whole family thinks about him all the time. And one of the things we do think about is if uh, a Boston uh, of today, uh, the Boston that supports, uh, strongly supports, um, arduously supports our LGBTQ community, if that was the situation in 1994, we probably wouldn't have not have lost our, our cousin. And so that's constantly reminding uh, me of, of, of his passing, but also for those that are in this chamber or those that are tuning in that have lost a loved one, that uh, I, I understand that and that we do think about our loved ones every day and wish that we could have that moment uh, every day like Council Mejia just alluded to. So please add my name and uh, encourage others to join as well. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Those wishing to add the name, please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, uh, please add Councilor Arroyo, Councilor Baugh, Councilor Braden, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, Council Baker, Council Flaherty, Council Eugene, uh, Council Murphy, Council Rell, and please add the chair. Councilors, Councilors Mejia, Lara, and Arroyo are seeking suspension of rules and adoption of docket 0592. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0593. Docket number 0593, Council of Flynn offer the following. Resolution recognizing the contributions of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders during Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in May. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The chair now recognizes Councillor Flynn. Councillor Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. Council Royal, may I add Councilor Fernandez, Fernandez Anderson as an original co-sponsor? Seeing no objection, she is now added. Thank you. Many, many know that I represent the largest AAPI community in Boston, mostly in Chinatown, but also in the South End and in South Boston as well. Outside of my district, we have a vibrant Vietnamese community that's in Council of Baker's district. Um, and Council of Braden also has a large Korean community as well. Um, and Council of Bach has a large a AAPI community, um, as do other councilors. Uh, there's a large Cambodian community outside of Boston, up in, up in Lowell. Um, over the weekend, I had the opportunity to attend the Asian Jade Banquet which is a, a celebration of Asian police officers throughout New England. And they came together and talked about the important role of Asian and Asian American police officers that play in our cities and towns, and they, they do a, an exceptional job. But I, I, I always come back to a story that I, I have said several times, but when the Chinese community first came, to the United States. They helped build the United States, literally, with the Transcontinental Railroad. And Chinese laborers, along with Irish laborers, connected the East Coast and, and the West Coast. And they connected up 
up at um, outside of Salt Lake City. And there's this, there's a famous photo of kind of a ribbon cutting ceremony completing completing the railroad. And there's about 200 people in one of these old photos. And of the 200 people, there's not one Asian person in the photo, um, even though they practically built built the railroad. And after after completing the railroad, what did the U.S. government do? We enacted the Chinese Exclusion Act, which excluded Chinese from coming to the United States. It was the first time that the United States intentionally excluded an ethnic an ethnic group from coming in here. We also, during the during World War II, we imprisoned Japanese Americans, mostly out on the West Coast in California and some other some other states as well, even though they were born here. Um, during this pandemic, we actually held the first public town hall meeting on COVID-19 in the country. And that was at Josiah Quincy School. And there was a young woman, she was a student at, at either Boston Latin or Boston Latin Academy. And this was in January, 2020. And COVID really, didn't hit this part of the United States yet, but we, we knew it was coming. And this student got on the train heading to school. And when she got on the train, she walked into the train and all the other people on the train got off the train um, because they associated her with, with COVID-19. She was a young kid, probably 16 or 17 years old, telling, telling me that story at this, at this town hall. Um, and then I thought to myself, you know, we're gonna see a lot of anti-Asian racism in this country, anti-Asian hate, hate crimes that have happened here in the city of Boston, not just with the AAPI community, but with immigrants, the communities of color as well. LGBTQ, as, as Council of Flaherty has mentioned also. Um, and these, these hate crimes against our immigrants continue to, to this day. I was at a, a hearing the other night and an elderly Asian woman was visiting Boston. I think she lived in Somerville. She was probably 80 years old. She got punched in the head by a young guy, probably, probably 20 years old, just, just because she was Asian. Um, but, what I, but what I wanna do as we celebrate AAPI Certainly, we, we have to deal with the discrimination and the hate crimes, but also to celebrate the important role the Asian community has played in the United States, the contributions and the sacrifices that they made for our city and for our country. So I'm proud to partner with Councilor Fernandez Anderson, but I, I also want to say to my colleagues, I know you, you have also supported the AAPI community, not just today or this month, but throughout the year. So I want to rec recognize my colleagues uh, for the tremendous work they do in this field. And I also want to recognize um, our first mayor of the city of Boston, Mayor, mayor Wu, who we've uh, partnered on, on this resolution many times before, but just want to say thank you to the mayor for her important work as well. So um, thank you, Mr. Thank you, um, Council Royal, for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Councilor Flynn. Uh, the chair now recognizes Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Councillor. Uh, sorry, President Flynn, for filing this resolution. Um, and I just wanted to um, take a moment to just, you know, um, sort of not go by the formalities and just express my sentiments around this. Um, when I arrived to the United States and did not, and w I was looking for a job to. Um, save money so that I can bring my brother and sister and I would save every little bit and I didn't have a green card so I would I found a way and there was a few friends in Cambridge that um, I met some Bengalis and um, uh, and other uh, Nepalese friends that had hooked me up with some jobs and we would all work together and the, of course the joke was that immigrants that we work two three jobs and um, Sometimes we're called, you know, it, people would say, are you Jamaican if you work more than three jobs, right? 
So we all share this um, culture of working hard and being disciplined and putting out um, you know, a lot of work because of our um, you know, ethics or work ethics in terms of being disciplined and putting out work. But I, a lot of my friends also um, share the sentiment, and as you know, um, Muslims being highly um, Asian or Asian Pacific um, Islanders, sp share this expression that, or the sentiment that because, we're, because they work very hard and because they're disciplined or humble in the way that they um, ask for recognition, that they are not recognized as human beings for the work that they put out. And not to repeat everything that um, Council Flynn has said, but I was really happy that you mentioned all of the different historic contributions to the United States in building this country, but also um, all of the hardships that people have gone through. And I think that a lot of the times, human, as human beings, we're not very good with the unknown, so we wait for this paradigm shift to ch take us to, oh, wait, it's wrong to discriminate against LGBTQI. Oh, wait, it's wrong to be uh, to discriminate against blacks. Oh wait, it's wrong to be this way or that way. So I think that we should try to get into the culture of being open and understanding that p there are nuances as, and, and as Councillor um, Lara has mentioned, we're not a monolith. So that's not or to any, and that's to every group. Everybody, there's nuances and culture and differences and music and food and everybody's different. And I think what happens is we, we tend to clump up people in one category or one bucket, Asians, that's it. But there's so much beauty and diversity and language and culture that comes with um, the different type, the different um, uh, Asians and um, Asia Pacific Islanders. I'm so happy to partner with you in this and thank you so much for, so much for your work, but not just because you're, um, not just because you represent a lot of Asians but because you're, you are a very kind man, Council Flynn, um, and I really just appreciate you for taking the time. And not, it's not about votes for you, it's like, this, these are the people I'm rep I represent and I'm gonna do that to the best of my ability with heart and passion, and I appreciate you for that. Thank you, Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Would anyone else like to speak? Seeing no one, would anyone else like to add their name? Mr. Clerk, please add Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, Councilor Braden. Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Lara, Councillor Louis Jen, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Rell, and please add my name. Uh, Councillor Flynn seeks suspension of the rules and passage of docket 0593. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Docket 0593 has been adopted. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. Mr. Clerk, will you please read docket 0594, please? Docket number 0594, Councilor Mejia offer the following. Resolution in support of Senate 2671, an act relative to forfeiture reform in Senate 2105, an act relative to civil asset forfeiture data reporting. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Mejia. Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to suspend Rule 12 and add Councilor Arroyo and Lara as original co-sponsors. Hearing no objection, uh, Councilor Arroyo and Councilor Lara are so added. Thank uh, you. Um, in March, uh, the Committee on Government Accountability and Transparency and Accessibility held its maiden hearing on docket 0200 in order for a hearing on government accountability um, transparency um, and accountability in, towards surveillance equipment. We learned a lot regarding the purchasing of the cell site stimulator and how it's used and what the process is in regards to civil asset forfeiture dollars are, and how they're used. We also walked away with a greater sense of knowledge about the current state of c civil asset forfeiture across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. According to the Institute of Justice, Massachusetts earns an F for its civil forfeiture laws, with the lowest bar um, to forfeiture, poor protections for the innocent, and a large profit incentives. We have to do better. Fortunately, there is legislation at the state level that seeks to make an impact. 
An act relative to forfeiture reform will require the attorney general, each district attorney, and each police department to file an annual report with the Executive Office of Administration and Finance and the House and Senate Committees on Ways and Means detailing all assets, monies, proceeds from the assets seized pursuant to this section. An act relative, relative um, to civil asset forfeiture data reporting will require the state treasurer to establish and maintain a case tracking system and searchable public website that includes, among other things, name of the law enforcement agency that seized the property, date of the seizure, type of property seized, estimated value of the seizure, the outcome of the, su the suspect's arrest, and more. These are small changes that will by no means fix everything wrong with our civil as asset forfeiture policies, but they are a start in the right direction that has a positive impact on the state of government accountability, transparency, and accessibility. I'd like to thank um, Alex Marthews for bringing these, um, these pieces of legislation to our attention, as well as Fatima Mohammed Mahat and Kay Crawford from their, for their tireless work in seeking transparency and accountability. I move that we suspend the rules and urge my colleagues to vote in favor of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Uh, civil asset forfeiture in Massachusetts has the, uh, is the sole one in the entire country with 50 states where the only one in which you can seize assets just on the basis of probable cause, uh, which is the lowest form uh, and the lowest bar. Uh, and so, you know, civil asset forfeiture has a number of issues, including the fact that uh, we can seize assets when there's no charges brought. We can seize assets even in cases that end up dismissed or where a jury ultimately finds them not guilty. Uh, and in the state that has occurred uh, in, in multiple jurisdictions, this doesn't address that. Uh, this doesn't change the bar. This also doesn't create any restrictions on where and how that money is used. The only thing that this does is create uh, transparency in the data of what assets are seized, when they are seized, and what cases are they seized, and how they are spent. But it doesn't in any way, shape, or form impact the bar uh, to seize them or the process to seize them, nor does it change uh, in any way the decision making uh, and the processes that allow that money to be spent uh, in, in whatever way they, they deign to spend it. Uh, obviously those are reforms that I would support uh, and, and look forward to seeing happen, but this doesn't do that. What this does is it says when and where we are seizing assets, when and how we are seizing assets should be uh, transparent to the public. We should be able to see those things. We should be able to know what cases they come from. We should be able to know how they are spent. We should be able to know ultimately what the outcome of those charges, if there are charges, are. Uh, and I think that transparency is a good thing for the Commonwealth, uh, especially in light of the fact that we are the only state that allows those seizures uh, at a probable cause standard. Uh, and so with that, I, I have, uh, I'm happy to sponsor this uh, and look forward to seeing uh, appropriate action uh, in support of Senate Bill 2671. Thank you. Thank you, Council Royal. The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to uh, my co-sponsors. I have very little to say um, for two reasons. One, because my colleagues have outlined the importance of this bill and this resolution um, so very clearly, and two, because I have been out since seven in the morning and I'm running out of steam. Um, <laughs> I am incredibly supportive of this matter. When we held our hearing on the purchase of the cell site simulator by the Boston Police Department, um, I had all of these questions and it became very obvious that there was um, policy changes that needed to happen at the state level um, in terms of what we could do to reform um, civil asset forfeiture. And so I'm excited to support this resolution. I'm excited to support this bill. And like Councilor Arroyo mentioned, I hope that um, it's gathering this data and having the information is only going to give us everything that we need to make sure that further reform comes down the line. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you to the sponsors, and I appreciate the clarification from our colleague, Council Royal. Those are just the questions that I had. And I guess the question through the chair to the makers, would they consider having a hearing in, as opposed to sort of a suspension and adoption so we can kind of break that down? I know the way it works now is that 
Um, the, the, the proceeds are divided, I believe. Half uh, go to the law enforcement agency and the other half goes to uh, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office. I think that's the way that it was always broken down. Uh, I've made efforts on this floor to try to have those funds or at least have uh, treatment and recovery be sort of the third leg of that school, particularly uh, stool, and, and particularly in instances where there was a, uh, it was a result of a drug forfeiture, but, uh, and they would resist it vehemently. Um, clearly, uh, Boston Police had their thoughts and ideas as to where they wanted to spend their forfeiture money. The district attorney's office thought that they had their ideas, but we always were pushing from this body to get treatment and recovery into that equation if we're gonna seize those assets, uh, and it's a result of, uh, of uh, a case involved drugs and alcohol. We felt that it should go to treatment and recovery. So I would love an opportunity to bring the appropriate parties down and have that discussion in terms of clearly how the forfeiture happens and the mindset behind it, but whether or not it makes sense to potentially maybe inject treatment and recovery uh, into that equation once again. But again, that's just through the makers. I do appreciate the clarification uh, and um, look forward to seeing whether or not hearing makes uh, appropriate sense. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Just want to respond to Council Flaherty, Council Mejia. Council Flaherty asked if, as the original sponsor, would you consider a hearing order and not a resolution? Just want to recognize you, Council Mejia. So I, I, I don't ride solo. I have my co-sponsors to um, help to weigh in. Uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that this is something that's happening in the Senate, right? Um, and this is a resolution on the Council floor in, in, in support of it, right? That's one. And number two, we did have a hearing in regards to this conversation, so I do think that I just want to honor that that conversation um, is still being held in my committee. Um, so there might be opportunities in the future to unpack specifically what you're talking about, but I just want to be really clear that this is a resolution um, in support of something that is at the House right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Would anyone else like to speak on this matter? Would anyone else like to add their name? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councillor Bach, Councillor Braden, Councillor Lujan, Councillor Mejia is seeking suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0594. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket has been adopted. Mr. Clerk, please read docket 0595. Docket number 0595. Council Lujan offer the following. Resolution recognizing May as Haitian Heritage Month. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The Chair recognizes Council Eugen. Council Eugen, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I am very excited uh, to be rising today in uh, recognition of May as Haitian Heritage Month. Um, actually, Boston is the first uh, place where we started celebrating Haitian Heritage Month in 1998, and it's because of the number of events that happen in the month of May um, that, you know, that are relative to Haitian history that uh, it became a whole month, including uh, the most, you know, for me, the most important Haitian holiday is our Independence Day, um, which is on January 1st. Uh, what Haiti was able to do in a 13-year slave revolt, the only, uh, the only republic born out of uh, a slave revolt, um, that is the most important holiday. But the most celebrated holiday in Haiti is actually um, May 18th, and it is a, a, a holiday celebrated around uh, the world in Haitian communities. It's our flag day where we honor Captain Flon for creating um, the Haitian flag by essentially tearing up the French flag and uh, creating something new from that, which is symbolic of everything that Haiti has represented and continues to represent. Um, you know, so much of the hate story of Haiti, as we know, um, you know, there's a lot of pride, but there's also, you know, a lot of pain. I, you know, I'm thinking just about the seven months in which you know, I was running uh, for city council, you know, the things that came up in the assassination of our president, an additional earthquake after continued trauma from our, the first earthquake that happened in 2010, um, you know, dodging hurricanes and, and really, in, and with the political instability in the country, a lot of it uh, the result of American foreign policy. So there's just so much there. Um, and I think too about just growing up as a, as a young Haitian woman in this city, um, you know, when I was in elementary school, we didn't have a Haitian Heritage Month. Um, and I was in a school, in elementary school, with a large Haitian population, but I was not in the English language learners class. Um, 
but I was noticeably Haitian. Um, and my father, who was at the school every day, uh, he's supposed to be here, but he's running late because that's what we do, we run late. Um, he, I couldn't hide the fact that I was Haitian, right? He was always in the school. He has a very thick Haitian accent when he speaks. Um, and in my classroom, there were other students who were Haitian, um, but you know, sometimes they didn't always mention it because they made fun of the Haitian, uh, the Haitian English language learners. And as a result of that, they made fun of me in my classroom. Um, and I think about how um, confusing that was as a young elementary student, not knowing why it was worth making fun of people trying to learn English, or why it was worth making fun of people who had dark skin. Um, and so when I now, as a full adult, and now as a Boston City Councilor, go into classrooms and go into elementary school rooms, I always remember that little girl who was in those classrooms and who wanted to see someone say, it is more than okay to be proud of who you are and of where you come from. And so I'm really happy that I had this opportunity, my father who just wanted to, because he's late, <laughs> um, to, <laughs> to honor um, Haitian Heritage Month and to also you know, honor my dad, who is one of the reasons why I am able to stand here as a very proud Haitian person. He made sure that my sisters and I were reading Haitian Creole, were speaking it, um, which is a, a, lot, a thing that a lot of people can do if you weren't born in Haiti. And so he made me, even though um, it wasn't cool for your dad to, to make you someone uh, carry your pride, he made me carry the pride of this flag everywhere that I went. And so uh, building on that, we have this whole month uh, where we're doing a lot of really awesome programming. Um, the USS Constitution Museum in Charleston actually has original letters from Toussaint Louverture, where he, uh, the Haitian freedom fighter, who is the cause um, and the reason for our freedom and really showed the example to the world of what um, uh, enslaved peoples can be and become and how we could break off the shackles of, of slavery. Um, we are having the Haitian uh, Flag Day Parade on, the, on May 15th. We'll also, this council has actually had a breakfast honoring a Haitian Flag Day every year. And for the first time, since we have a Haitian American city councilor, I will be hosting it. Um, my announcement for the week, I'm just putting it here, is um, that uh, I invite all of you to that breakfast happening here uh, next Friday at 10.30 a.m. Um, I also just want to also recognize the number of Haitians working here in City Hall, including my cousin, um, Tisha Lee, who is here. Um, I just, there, there's so many of us here, and I think it's important. I always say that the third largest Haitian diaspora is here in Boston. That is cognizable. It is here in the city of, um, in, in, the, in City Hall, um, and, and, you know, in our hospitals, in our schools, um, everywhere we are. And so I'm just so grateful that I now have this ability to do this, um, to uh, be a representative for my people. Um, and I know that this hearing was also filed last year by Anissa Sabi George and Andrea Campbell. So many people here have. Um, you know, represent communities that are the thriving Haitian communities. I think of Council Orel, I think of uh, Council Arroyo. Um, I know that we have many friends here, um, and I just am so grateful for the work that we do, um, not only to, you know, go to Haitian communities when they need, um, you know, when it's time to get a vote or, you know, to say that I'm a good friend, but to really do the real work of being in deep partnership with communities that are often struggling, right? We have folks coming here from the border. We have folks who are being displaced by fires. We have Haitian nonprofits that are running on shoestring budgets. Um, we have a, 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 a diaspora here that is in deep, deep need of having a place where we can be centered and anchored in our culture um, when things happen. So I just thank you all for your commitment to the Haitian community here um, and to the work that we are going to do together. I'm just gonna say this a little bit. Merci en pile, parce que j'ai occasion ça pour me célébrer moi, étage haïtien, la ville de Boston, nous connaît là, City Hall, il y a un peu de monde, tout le monde qui est là, qui travaille là, et puis nous menons tout le monde, tout le monde qui est là. Je dis merci à tout le monde qui est là, parce que c'est vous-même qui pensez que la liberté est un peu de choses, nous ne sommes pas là. Nous connaissons des gens qui ont 18 mai, c'est un gros fête, 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 c'est un um, so I just want to say thank you to everyone and thank you to my council colleagues. I hope to see you all next Friday at the breakfast and uh, thank you for the work that you do for me and my people. Thank you. Thank you, Council Jen. And on behalf of the, the body, um, we also want to welcome your dad here. Um, we're, proud, we're proud to have you here as well. Welcome. 
The chair recognizes Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, please uh, add my name uh, to this resolution as the very first uh, sponsor of that breakfast that uh, passed it on, working with Eno Mondesere uh, back in the day, passed it on to uh, former Councilor Rob Consalvo, who passed it on to uh, former Councilor Tim McCarthy, who passed it on to our colleague Ricardo Arroyo, who obviously has passed it on to our first Haitian American uh, here uh, in Route Z, Louis, Jean, Louis Jean. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, come <laughs> along to that breakfast, but also uh, to uh, uh, her dad, we may want to hook him up with Kerry because uh, he came in a little late after her speech. So we may be able to get him the full tape uh, working through central staff uh, so that he didn't miss the uh, he didn't miss all the action. All right, thank you, Mr. President. Great, great recommendation, Council Flaherty. Thank you. The chair recognizes Councilor Arroyo. Councilor Arroyo, you thank have you. the floor. Thank you, uh, Councilor Louis Uh You know the country of Haiti is uh, really a beacon for the world. Uh, in the way in which they were formed uh, in a slave revolt successfully. Uh, and much of the trauma and harm uh, that Haiti has experienced has been the result of foreign policy, frankly, from places like the United States of America, which at the time uh, were slave owning uh, and had slave owning leadership uh, that saw Haiti as an existential crisis. Uh, and so there's many different ways in which I think uh, we can raise our voice to uh, ensure that we are relieving them uh, frankly, of the harm that has been done in all of our names. Uh, and I know one of the ways in which uh, we can do so as well is pushing for uh, the repayment uh, from France to Haiti uh, for the debt in which they have incurred uh, upon Haiti, which was fully paid, which was for themselves. Uh, Haiti, uh, upon their liberation, uh, was imposed the debt from France uh, where they were to pay for their own freedom. Uh, and that should be uh, returned, and, I, and I'd raise my voice to that. And I will say that as we uh, have uh, the privilege and the benefit of a large Haitian population here in Boston, I, I believe I have the district with uh, the most members of the Haitian diaspora uh, in the city of Boston, the breadth of just service that has come from that, uh, the culture and in the ways in which they have lifted up our small businesses, uh, have joined in and been parts of our community and making them better and in, in bringing in soccer leagues and in doing all of these different things that have created a better day-to-day uh, -day for all members of our city. Uh, I'm grateful to them. I'm grateful for their spirit, uh, for their resilience, uh, and for their pride and where they come from, uh, both from a historic way, from a, a personal way, from their homeland, but also in the ways in which uh, they uphold their culture and their tradition uh, so proudly for all the rest of us who are members of different diasporas. Uh, to see, and so I'm very grateful to uh, Councilor Louis Jen for raising this. I am in full-throated support of this, so please add my name. Uh, and I'm grateful to our Haitian community here in Boston for all that they do, uh, and for the country of Haiti for all they have done for other countries like the one that my parents come from, who have also uh, grappled with colonialism and with imperialism, and in that specific case, uh, the the ultimate sin of, of slavery. And so thank you for, for that, uh, and thank you to all Haitians for uh, uplifting their country uh, here at home. So thank you, Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Councilor Royal. The chair recognizes Councilor Lara. Councilor Council Lara, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you, President Flynn. I think Councilor Fernandez Anderson was before me, but um, she very graciously gave me her spot. Um, I, I wanted to rise in support of this and to thank Councilor Lujan for filing it. Um, I've said this before, and I want to say this again that black people all across the diaspora in this entire world owe the people of Haiti a great debt and that we are um, where we are now because of, of their fervor and because of their fight for liberation. And I also want to stand because I think it's incredibly important to publicly show support as a woman from the Dominican Republic. Um, I think that, you know, what we have seen happening on the Dominican and Haitian border in the past few years has been unconscionable. And I think that as people of the Dominican diaspora here in the United States, we have a responsibility to stand in solidarity with the Haitian people. And with your permission, I would like to speak in Spanish. Estoy eh, muy orgullosa de, de pararme y presentar mi apoyo para la resolución eh, de tener, de hacer el mes de mayo eh, el mes de patrimonio eh, haitiano aquí en la ciudad de Boston. 
eh, estoy apoyando esta resolución de la concejal Luis Jen porque pienso que la comunidad dominicana tiene una responsabilidad de eh, pararse en, sol en solidaridad, excúsenme, eh, con las personas de Haití, especialmente aquí en los Estados Unidos y en nuestro país de la República Dominicana. So thank you, Councilor Luis Jen, um, for filing this and please add my name. Thank you, Council Lara. The chair recognizes Council Fernandez Anderson. Council Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Well, we're just going to make this uh, multicultural, whatever, because. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, bonsoir, mon peuple haitien. Um, comment s'appelle ton père? Robert. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> Not Robert. <laughs> huh? Robert. Um, Robert, merci, merci um, for everything that you do for our uh, Ruzi. Um, I always say, when I met your dad, I would told him, I said, um, you know, je ne parle pas, pas, pas créole, mais je parle français. Si tu parles français, je, lentement, je peux comprendre. But, she, but he was like, okay, no, it doesn't matter. You're speaking and we understand, let's go. <laughs> so I really, I really love your dad and appreciate um, watching this. And um, during the campaign, I would tell the people the same thing. I'd be like, hey, you're my cousins because y'all left K Verde, right? West Africa went in um, IT being, or Cuba as well, being one of the first islands to land. So literally, we eat your food. Thank you for your zook. <laughs> Um, I know Kasaf is not Haitian, but still, it's your culture, and thank you for your food. Um, Cape Verde being that it's a very uh, uh, new civilization, or um, in terms of post-colonial, we didn't have TV, we didn't have music, we didn't have a lot. So we benefit from your culture, and we dance your music, and your food, and your traditions, or rather what you left behind. So um, merci for uh, being here, for being present. But I also think that, you know, I literally just watched the documentary again, because I love watching it again and again and again, to remind me that um, how we have the strength to be able to fight. But I have great respect for the Haitian people for their strength, for just the story and how they really showed the world um, and being the only one to fight uh, colonial, colonialism. So uh, shout out to Toussaint Louverture, as you said, um, and thank you so much for being here. And I would hope that um, in the way that I treat you, in the way that I interact with you, is exemplary in how I respect you um, and love you. So I'm good to you for that reason because you are a priority for me. Thank you. Love you. Thank you, Council Fernandez Anderson. The chair recognizes Council Mejia. Council Mejia, you have the floor. Yeah, I am so incredibly happy to have our first, and I hope will not be our last, Haitian representation here on the city council. So thank you, Council Louis Jean, for everything that you do, not only to just amplify the voices of our people, um, but to also continue to fight as hard as you do. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to share the same sentiments as Councillor Lada. You know, I always talk about being an Afro um, Latina and really claiming my black roots, right? I think that um, Dominicans really struggle with recognizing that we share the island of Esquisqueya and that this is an opportunity for us to really, as Dominicans, to really lean into this conversation that we're here because of you. And I think that's really hard for a lot of Dominicans to, um, to digest. And I actually met your dad even before I was even thinking of running um, when I was advocating in deep collaboration with the Haitian community during the earthquake because there was a lot of tension with Dominicans and Haitians here in the city of Boston. And I think that this solidarity not needs to just be here on this council floor, but we need to work in collaboration and bring our communities together to recognize that we need each other and we need to continue to fight for one another. And I do so in the spirit alongside you, Councillor Louis Jean, um, for this day and every day. Thank you. And please sign my name. Thank you, Council Mejia. The chair recognizes Council Braden. Council Braden, thank you. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, uh, Council Louisian, for this uh, celebration of Haitian Heritage Month. You know, you've met my my nephew Jermaine, and uh, he's a, a very tall, handsome black man who came from Port-au-Prince. Um, as a very little child. His mom is from Haiti, and uh, he, she's married to my brother-in-law, Henry McCarthy. 
and uh, they live in New Orleans. And uh, my association with that family and, and by extension uh, the Haitian community um, is limited in many, many ways, but I, it, I just one thing that impresses me is the incredible tenacity, perseverance, and courage of the Haitian people in the in the in the face of so many recurrent and and, and sequential challenges, natural disasters, political strife, and and political unrest over the last uh, of hist of the, over the history of the of your nation, and uh, I'm very honoured to. Ha consider you a friend and a colleague on the Boston City Council, the first Haitian woman. Uh, you walk in this, this, the, 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 you follow in the, in the path of a few other very strong and remarkable Haitian women in politics in Boston, and, and I'm so honored to have you as a friend and a colleague. So um, I wish all the, the folks in the Haitian diaspora here in Boston a very happy uh, celebration of Haitian Heritage Month. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The chair recognizes Council Worrell. Council Worrell, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn, and thank you to um, Council Louis Jen for uh, bringing this to the floor. I'm in support of this resolution, and I uh, just want to also add that, you know, just like the Haitian community, you know, um, setting the example of being resilient fighters and um, preserving through all the uh, turmoil that they have gone through, you know, you know Council Louis Jen brings that fighter spirit to the City Council. Um, and I'm a big fan of the culture, uh, just like uh, Councilor Tanya and um, Anderson has said, you know, the Pickleys, the Copa music, and I'm looking forward to celebrating the culture on Haitian Flag Day. Um, and I also know what it's like to have very prideful parents, me being a West Indian, um, it's, it's one thing that, you know, your parents are always happy for you when you're, you know, doing, doing the smallest things sometimes, or, you know, even to this height, you know, recognizing your, your culture. Um, and the Jamaicans also have a, a slogan that says, out of many, we are one. So it's in that collaborative effort that I look like we, um, united with the Haitian community in my district to kind of move things forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Worrell. The chair recognizes Council Eugene. Council Eugene, you have the floor. Yeah, sorry, I'm not going to take all that. I just want to say thank you to all my colleagues for your kind words. Um, sometimes we sit here and we pass these resolutions and we're like, what is it doing, right? I just want to say that I will. I tell people that you know, the city council is recognizing um, Haitian Heritage Month. We passed a unanimous resolution, God willing, right? Um, and they just, they, it's, the, it's just the joy uh, for folks who for so long have been excluded who are downtrodden, who have been forced to go into this resiliency well. And I just think that like these small, they, they seem, it seems small, but it really does matter to a lot of people. You know, when I was, when Councilor Financial Anderson was here, recognizing Eid, you know, and, and, and fighting for it as a holiday, what that, when I looked around at, you know, the Muslim folks in this room and how much that meant to them, it's the same thing. So I just am so honored to have all of you speak so, so, um, so nicely about uh, the Haitian community here and hope that that also translates to the work that we have to do. So thank you, Messi Ampil. Que bon de beni tout monde. May God bless everyone. Thank you, Council Lujan. Anyone else like to speak? I, I would like to add that um, I'm also proud to sign on to this because of the incredible contributions and sacrifices of the Haitian and Haitian American community here in greater Boston. I was with Council Lujan several months ago out in front of the federal building where we, where we were protesting in support of fair immigration for, um, for the Haitian community that came to here, came to the United States during the earthquake in, 20, in 2010. And I was only, I was about 80 miles away from that earthquake when it, when it hit. And I, and I was part of the, I was part of the uh, <coughs> relief team, but I just wanted to say the, the resilience of the Haitian community here in our country um, is exceptional, and they add tremendous, uh, tremendously to Boston and to, the, and to the United States. So happy to sign on as well. Anyone else like to um, sign on? Please raise your hand. Mr. Clerk, please add Councillor Baker, Councillor Baugh, Councillor Braden, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Lara, Councillor Mejia, Councillor Murphy, Council Rowell and the Chair. Um, 
Council Lujan is seeking suspension of the rules and adoption of docket 0595. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The docket is passed. We are on to late files. I am informed by the clerk that there are zero late files. Um, zero. <laughs> We are on to green sheets. Anyone wishing to remove a, a matter from the green sheets may do so at this time. The consent agenda. We are now moving on to the consent agenda. I've been informed by the clerk that there is one addition to the consent agenda. Agenda. The chair moves for the adoption of the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor say aye. aye. All, those all those opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Thank you. The consent agenda has been Adopted. Announcements. Any of our colleagues like to make a, a brief announcement? The chair recognizes Council Alara. Council Alara, you have the floor. Thank you, President Flynn. Oh my God, I've stood up so much today. Uh, today is Council Flaherty's birthday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday. Yeah, can we do? Yeah. Hey, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ramadan is over. Thank, thank you, Council Lara. <laughs> for, for, the, for the record, Council Flaherty is one year older than I am. <laughs> um, the chair recognizes Council Baker. Council Baker, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I just rise to um, wish everybody a happy Mother's Day. All the mothers out there, the mother is the most important person in the family. My mother actually, if she were still alive, would be 95 this, this Sunday. So I want to say happy birthday and happy Mother's Day to my mom and also to my wife. Happy Mother's Day. The most important person in the, in the family unit is the mom. So all you women out there who have children, you're a blessing. Thank you. Well said, Council Baker. The chair recognizes Council Arroyo. Council Arroyo, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to wish my partner a happy birthday. Not Councillor Flaherty, though. Happy birthday to Councillor Flaherty. Uh, but uh, Jennifer, or, or Jenny, uh, today is her birthday. Uh, and uh, folks who are in this business know how much we balance personal and private life, uh, personal private life with public life uh, and the sacrifices that our loved ones make. And she has made many uh, in, in the years that we have been together. Uh, and she's been a rock uh, to me and to uh, our, our, our little family unit. Uh, I love her immensely. Uh, I am hoping that today is a wonderful day for her, uh, and I will try to do my part to make that so. Uh, but uh, I would be remiss if I did not thank her publicly in this way for the ways in which she has allowed me to serve uh, my community uh, and been an integral part of my ability to be successful in doing that, uh, and in the ways in which she has lifted up her own family uh, and been selfless in how she gives of herself every day uh, to everyone she loves and there are folks on this council who know her and, and recognize her spirit and, and what she is and uh, probably are wondering why she's with me and, and it's a question I ask myself very often uh, and so the least I could do is is give her these shout outs on the council floor because that it doesn't it doesn't hurt uh, so thank you councillor <laughs> president Flynn. thank you council royal um, both both lights went up at the same time um, the chair recognizes Council Braden, Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I just want to um, extend my condolences to the family of Michael Moran's uh, wife, uh, Helene Palad Paladaro. Uh, Pad Padalaro. Her her mom passed away this week suddenly, and uh, um, I just want to extend our, our sympathy and our condolences to the Moran uh, family. Um, the grandchildren, Ellie and Addie, have lost her grandma, and uh, we want to uh, express our sadness at her sudden passing. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. The chair recognizes Council Block. Council Block, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. Um, the appointment letters from the mayor uh, earlier in our meeting uh, had a familiar name on them, Henry Santana. Um, and so I just wanted to take uh, this moment to congratulate and recognize um, Henry, who uh, it was announced a couple of weeks ago, but it was when the council was out of session for school vacation week, has become the mayor's um, director of civic organizing. 
Um, as folks in this council know, Henry uh, used to work on my team here in the council, um, and before that on my campaign. He also worked for a time for Councillor Mejia, um, and uh, is just a, a tremendous individual, and, um, and I think just perfect for this role, because it's a job, you know, the, the newly kind of conceived Office of C Civic Organizing is both doing some of the traditional programs that people ha have known and love, Love Your Block and City Hall on the Go, but also really thinking about how City Hall engages in civic organizing and how kind of in the way that councilors have done personally today, like we bring all of our communities into the chamber and into City Hall, um, but in this case kind of at the grassroots level. And um, I just think about when, when, even in our office, when we were uh, engaging in the conversation about the Mission Hill Playground and its renovation, Henry was the first person to like go and say, hey, let's actually make sure that the young people who go to the Tobin School and who live in Mission Maine right next door, let's make sure that those people are actually like in this process and we're not just having a bunch of playground meetings in which no young people participate. Um, and the upshot of all of that was that we got the first full size basketball court included in the plans for that um, playground. And it's a little example, but it's the type of thing where I just think that um, he's gonna do a great job keeping City Hall honest on, uh, you know, in all of the things, all the initiatives that we work on, like what's the real grassroots bottom up organizing that's happening um, and not just kind of soliciting people for their feedback, but making sure that we're actually hearing what's welling up. And so um, I'm just really excited uh, that the mayor's recognized his talent and put him in this role. And I am looking forward to collaborating and as I'm sure many other counselors will as well, but uh, he, uh, he just did a great job in my office and um, I wanted to take this moment to congratulate him. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Block. The chair recognizes Council Flaherty. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Just got where there was a collapse at the Edison power plant that they're renovating, so just want to give councilors an opportunity to offer prayers uh, to those that are several folks trapped. So the Boston Fire Department's there trying to uh, extricate, extricate mm -hmm. and hopefully that won't result in any casualties, but it's a serious situation that uh, is currently happening in our city. So I thought some prayers to those workers, the families, and our first responders who are there now doing what they do best, and hopefully uh, we'll get folks out. Thank you, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Flaherty, for that, that important message. And I want to just acknowledge my friend in the back there, John Provenzano, that worked, worked there. So I just want to say our, our, our prayers are with um, your, your friends there, John. Thank you, John. Our prayers are with, with, with those guys. Um, We, we, yes, yes, Councillor Braden. Councillor Braden, you have the floor. Since we're celebrating, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah. Uh, since we're celebrating birthdays, um, I, I just want to take the opportunity to wish uh, my policy director, Wen Ye, a very happy birthday on Friday. Um, he's a tireless worker, and um, it's um, happy birthday, Wayne. <laughs> Um, thank you. Memorials. Today we're going to adjourn our meeting in memory of the following individuals. For Councillor Braden, Sandra Lee Belmont Padalaro. For Councillor Lujan, Elizabeth Rideout, Karen Smith. For Councillor Flaherty, Henry Denalecki. For the body, for the City Council body, central staff and Council Flaherty, Daryl Alfonso Roal. When, the, when we move today to adjourn, we do so in those mentioned individuals. We are now scheduled to meet again in the Ionella Chamber on Wednesday, May 11th at 12 noon. All in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 The Council is adjourned. Thank you, central staff, and um, thank you to the clerk's office. Thank you.